I apologize that we are late. It was entirely my fault. I got to chatting with people. Shouldn't have done that. Should have just ignored it, folks. So that's not Would you stand with me, please? And uh, turn to hymn number 108. And we will begin singing this morning about glorifying the name. Pray that it 
God bless you. You can have a seat. Thank you. Thank you guys for helping and making it work. Beautiful. Would you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Esther? <clears throat> Very interesting um, book. That's uh, one that's kind of criticized. It's one of the few books in the Old Testament that's not referred to in the New Testament. It's basically written, uh, as, as best we understand it, it was written as a justification um, or to tell the story of the Jewish feast of Purim, which has to do with the casting of lots. And you kind of find that in there. If you've got a reference Bible, it, it probably made some, some remarks about that. I, I don't want to talk a lot about the history of it because I have uh, actually two full pages of notes here to do with that. As I read this, I, I got um, very much um, blessed and encouraged by what I read, challenged by what I read. <clears throat> Not just uh, actually uh, very little bit out of the story in the way that we normally think about it. So um, we know that this book <clears throat> took place uh, during the time of the Persian um, conquest of Israel. Uh, I think last week I gave you a date uh, of uh, when it happened from Mir's book. Uh, um, so what the Bible was all about. And we're not going to go into all that again. It's actually, we're going to start with one one here in just a second. And we name some people who are historical people <clears throat> that we can uh, kind of gather what it was. So uh, let me just kind of jump into this. The great theme of this book, and we're trying to look at the big picture, so we'll start out with it, hopefully we'll end with it. The great theme is God's protection of his called people, a people through whom he will bless the world in Jesus. <clears throat> so that's the great theme. Now, if we look just a little bit deeper and kind of focus in, we will see that it, that great theme is counterposed against Haman's self-centeredness. So we have a heroine and we've got a villain in this story and um, the, the interaction actually between the two, although they have very little interaction, that brings about the, the culmination of this whole thing. So um, there's a story here for us. So the title of this is In Such a Time as This. And again, I want to I emphasize um, we're trying to look at the big picture here and I hope that we're able to do that <clears throat> today and not, and not narrow down into a, a lot of, of moralizing. So, um, but let's look. <clears throat> so let's just get into this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's see what we can do. So it says, now in the days of Asherahs, the Asherahs who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. And then it goes on to talk about it. So Andy, if you put up that first slide, I have a, a PowerPoint today that has two slides. Okay. Yeah. A whole two. You can believe how long it took to put all that together. All right. So that was supposed to be in color. There's a little bit of color on there. Uh, it, it was in color when I sent it. All right, so his, well, let me read it because it says, it says from India, so that's going to be way off over here to your right, to uh, Ethiopia, which is going to be, if you're looking at this, it's going to be around like this and around to the, to the left. Um, you see the Red Sea there in, the, in kind of the lower left corner. It says the Persian Empire. You can kind of see the seas because they're in blue. So this was this was just a huge area. And by the way, we'll look look at some of this a little bit later when we get into Daniel and we talk about those beasts and the kingdoms that are represented by those beasts. Oh, by the way, the colors back there. It's showing up on that one. Yeah. It's disappointing, isn't it? I get to see the good picture, and you guys have to look at this. I don't know why that. I don't know why it does that. Um, Andy's probably back there now trying to adjust the color on it and 
Next thing you know, it'll all turn purple or something. So, all right. So there you can see, if you just want to turn around for an instant, and you can see the extent of the Purdue It was the then known, um, then known world. And we'll see later that that, that basic area, mm -hmm. um, that's more than the Assyrians conquered. It's a little bit less than the Greeks conquered which is the next world empire that comes on the scene, and it's considerably less than the Romans conquered, which is the final one we'll actually look at when we get into the book of the book of Daniel. So, large kingdom. Now, chapter 1, verses uh, 10 through 22, talk about the, the, key, the queen whose name is Vashti, and her refusal to come before the queen, which causes her to be Depose, come before the king, which causes her to be deposed as queen. <clears throat> Folks, we don't know any details. What we know is what scripture tells us, that this queen was called to come and appear before the court and to bring her crown, to come wearing her crown. So interestingly enough, some Bible commentaries, and, and actually it's been, there's probably been thousands of sermons all based on the theme that she refused to do some immoral thing like coming naked except for her headdress. Okay? It doesn't say that. The crown, by the way, was, was uh, could very well have been a symbol of power, authority, and wealth <clears throat> because they would, have, they would have made that thing as rich as they could because it was a symbol of this vast kingdom. And that's why, you know, even today we have what? In England we have what? The crown jewels. And uh, so I, I pity the person that you know, has to kind of wear that big monster set of heavy thing. <clears throat> so we have very few details. I just encourage you with this scripture and with all scripture, don't read into it what isn't there. God tells us what he wants us to know. And what we don't know is, uh, what we don't, what we aren't told may be as important as what we are. So we don't know why, but he... She wouldn't come for whatever reason, and he got rid of her. In chapter 2, Esther is made queen, and I use the term um, purposefully because she really had no choice. Okay? This was not a thing, you know, like, uh, who wants to be in America's Got Talent? You know, come and audition. <clears throat> they went and they gathered people up, and the king, because he was king, took who he wanted, and he took Esther who apparently <clears throat> hid her ethnicity from him. In chapter 2, verse 20, it tells us that Mordecai told her uh, not to. It says, Esther had not made known her kid or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. So she, did, she didn't tell, tell the, the king or the court or any of the people who were there that she was now, also in chapter 2, as we're going quickly through this, Mordecai discovers a plot, a plot to kill the king. And um, by the way, this guy was king for a little over 20 years. Okay? <clears throat> so as you get to the end of this story and you read to yourself, you know, oh, good, Esther's the queen, she's got Haman's house, Mordecai is the second in command of this whole country, they all lived happily ever after. Uh, for a little bit of time, okay? And uh, this dude was assassinated, and most of them were, which was why you weren't allowed to go into the room where the king was unless he asked for you. Because there were guards standing just inside that door, and if you came in without asking, they would, you know, lop off various and assorted parts of your body. You could say, it's just a scratch, but you would die anyway, all right? Okay, a couple of you get it. And that's, please don't tell anybody else that I looked at that movie. All right, so, so, so that's that's what was going on. So again, get a you know kind of get a, a context of history. But Mordecai discovers a plot. He tells Esther. She gets word to the king, and she's and she sends the word to the king in Mordecai's name, which is important. That comes up later on in the later on in the story. In chapter three, we. We see this Haman, he's the enemy, and he rises to prominence. Haman the arrogant, Haman, Haman the proud. 
And Mordecai refuses to bow before him and apparently claims a religious exemption. Now, folks, there's, I, I, I don't have time to go through all of this, um, but there are lots of applications to today. You're going to have to kind of just plug some of this stuff in as I go through. So he claims a religious, religious exemption, says, I'm not going to, but it didn't matter. Even though, even though he apparently had a right to do that, it filled him with fury. So let me read just a couple of verses. Chapter 3, verse 5. It says this, And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. And it says, But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Asherahs. So he was filled with fury. Chapter 5, verse 9, read another little verse. And Haman went out that day, <laughs> I love this, joyful and glad of heart. Why? Because he'd just been invited to a special banquet and the only guests were the queen, the king, and he, he was you know, he's sitting on top of the world. Nothing's going to bother him, all right? <laughs> uh, so he's joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Filled with wrath. Can I see slide two? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I'm going to pick on this. Poor, unfortunate um, little darling. Um, and I'm not trying to make a political statement by this, but when I thought about Mordecai, or when I thought about Haman, this is kind of the thing that I thought about, and I'm sure there are others, other examples. So uh, I want we'll ponder on her for a minute, so we'll just leave her up there. Um, if you don't like looking at her, you can look at me. Maybe you'd rather look at her. So we just kind of work, work our way through that. So he's filled with fury in chapter 3. In chapter 5, it just ruins his day. And, in, and we're going to read one more verse here in chapter 5. Uh, this is in um, verse 13. It says, um, he's talking about the feast. And it says in verse 13, yet all this is worth nothing to me. So long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. And I'll just read a little bit more because it kind of fills in the story. Then, then his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows 50 cubits high be made in the morning to tell the king to have Mordecai hang on it. But then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows. <coughs> Interesting enough. All right, so uh, I skipped over some of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sure that. I'm sure they read it. I pray that I pray that you do. There is nothing. This guy is the second most powerful person in that whole huge kingdom. And there is nothing in his life that pleases him that can't be destroyed by that humble Jew guy who sits at the gate. And in, in common vernacular, we would say Mordecai is living in his head rent free. Hey, he can ruin his day. Mordecai ruins his day just by being alive. So much so that he wants to kill him. And he will get rid of our screaming darling here for now. We'll bring her back a little bit later. <clears throat> I want to talk to you this morning, folks, about pride and the believer. And uh, the reason I want to <clears throat> uh, kind of emphasize this uh, is it's for practical applications for us today, but to kind of get you to think that Mordecai doesn't hate the Jews because he hates the Jews. He doesn't hate Mordecai because he's a Jew. Mordecai, excuse me, uh, did I say Mordecai in the wrong place? I'm sorry. Haman hates, <laughs> you got Mordecai hating Mordecai, huh? So, all right. Haman hates Mordecai because Haman loves himself. And Haman loves himself so much that he can't stand it when there's somebody else who doesn't love him the way he thinks he ought to be loved. 
you understood that kind of convoluted sentence, say amen or something. I've got a, I've got a list here of scriptures, and I, I, I printed these off my computer program. I won't read all of them. Not all of them are pertinent. I highlighted um, with my handy yellow highlighter some of them. Let me read this some. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 11, 12. Proverbs 13, 10. By pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Proverbs 16, 18. And you notice Proverbs usually has at least uh, two contradictory statements. You know, there's one statement and then there's a counterstatement against it. And that's the way Hebrew poetry worked. So it says in verse, uh, that's the way those two verses were. Pro Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride shall bring him, bring him low, but he that is of lowly spirit shall obtain honor. I'm not going to read all these. I just wanted to kind of give you an idea. I'll, I'll read a couple more here. They use the word proud. I looked up that word too. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to Jehovah. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And there's a whole series of scriptures here that basically um, God uses the word proud to talk about those he's going to punish. In other words, when, when God gets ready to deal with people, one of the negatives that he uses without, without a lot of, of, uh, uh, of, of introduction or explanation, he just says the proud will fall under judgment. He, he, he talks about those who are going to be judged as proud. So there is, uh, I, I know we have positive uses of the word, you know, we want to take pride in our workmanship and maybe we take pride in our appearance and there are some things where there are positives, but when we look at Scripture here, we don't we don't see it as a positive thing. Let me read you a couple more. These are from New Testament, although, although both of these are found in the Old Testament. It's actually a quote. James four six says, "But he giveth more grace." Wherefore Scripture says, "God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble." All right. Scripture says and which we already read in Proverbs 29, 23, that he resists the proud and that he gives grace to the humble is in Proverbs 3, 34. So James is writing and he's quoting those two Proverbs. 1 Peter 5, 5, Peter writes, Likewise, ye younger, be subject to the elder. Yea, all of you gird yourselves with humility. To what? To serve one another. For God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But I looked it up. I thought, well, isn't that interesting? It looks like Peter is quoting James, or was James quoting Peter? And I found out that neither one of them was quoting the other. They were both quoting the Old Testament and bringing it into the New Testament. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 30. And when you read Romans 1, you got this whole list of ways that people have turned away from God and the evidence of it. That's what Romans 1 is. It, it, it's like an indictment against the world of why it's worthy of judgment. And in, and in verse 30, he uses the word haughty and boastful people. So let me talk to you about this in just a minute and, and take the rest of my time here to kind of go over this. And I, I can't get into it in, in great detail, but let me just throw out a couple thoughts here. From Genesis 3, where, where man falls, he becomes self-aware. And he hid from God. Now, now why did they hide? They hid because they were what? Naked. Were they naked before? Did they hide before? No. So the difference was not the fact that I mean, they just didn't all of a sudden become naked. <laughs> you know, that's not the thing. They hid because they became aware that they were naked. The, the difference was their awareness of self. And they, they became ashamed, and their entire world, think about Haman, their entire world shrank and was focused on their weakness. And they hid because they had to protect themselves. And again, there's a lot to be talked about here, and I don't have time to talk about it all this morning. I know we've mentioned some aspects of this before, but I, I, I want to suggest to you that the vast majority of 
all of our time is spent protecting ourselves. We don't, uh, maybe we don't want to admit that, but without Jesus Christ, that's the way we live our lives. We try to create around us a world in which we can feel comfortable. And only, only relinquishing control of ourselves and relinquishing our lives to the Lord who made us and then redeemed us, frees us from this torture and torment of having to protect ourselves at all times. Haman hated the Jews because Mordecai did not support Haman's view of himself. So Haman just wasn't a hater. Haman was a self-lover. The source of his hate was self-love. And he was willing to destroy everyone or anyone who threatens this false inner reality. I've never found a passage of scripture that commands us to love ourselves. You can look for it if you wish. It does not say in scripture that we must love ourselves before we love others. There are people who have interpreted it that way, and it's a false interpretation. If you read it with any sort of just open-minded common sense, you'll realize that loving ourselves is a given, and it's used as a position uh, it's used to build a foundation to say, look, you already love yourself. Love this other person as you love yourself. It's pop psychology, but it's not based on this book. Throughout the Bible, love is seen as sacrifice. And if you love, then you give yourself up, just as Esther did. Esther walked in there and said, I'm going to do this even if it means I die. So be it. We can see that over and over and over again in Scripture, just as Jesus did. So we can, we can go through some of those verses, and you've encountered some of those verses, and it's popular to preach on that stuff today. Try not to get involved in that too much. It's popular to preach on that stuff today. Um, but if you read those verses with an open mind and read them in context... The Holy Spirit will guide you, and you'll see that's not, that's not what it's talking about. Much, much of the modern church teaches that since God loves us, the focus of our lives should be about ourselves. And if they don't say that directly, they, they do it indirectly by what they teach in other things. They, they, they teach us about how we're to have victory, and we're to have uh, our, our, uh, you know, our victory, and our peace, and our blessing, and our prosperity, and our well-being, and to use a wide term, I'll, I'll just use white being, etc. And if we were broken by sin, think with me, if we were broken by sin and we heard that God who created us loves us and died for us in our stead, then we would, if, if we were broken by sin, we would give him all the glory. But because we are broken by sin, so often our focus turns to ourselves. And it's popular Christian culture to continually remind people how much God loves them and how much God wants to meet their needs today so they can feel good about themselves. Because if they feel good about themselves from their experience, they're likely to come back. And you can say that's harsh and that's cynical. That's all right. I've heard that before. It's true nonetheless. And experience with God through Jesus Christ will cause you to love him more than you love yourself. It's supposed to cause you to love your neighbor and if love, as we have seen, and again, we don't have time to go through all the scriptures, if, if, if it is sacrifice, then we realize it's not about us. Can I see our, our darling picture again? <laughs> it's popular 
today in, in common culture to, to, to cast off all restraint. And um, I want to, and one of the reasons it is is because this expression of emotion is good for you. Okay. Uh, I, I can't, I don't have time to cover all this stuff. So, I, I, just a warning for Christians. We can get fearful and threatened also. And if we don't rely on the Lord, when we get fearful and threatened, we're going to have a similar response to the world. Step two of that is we can get fearful and threatened by one another. Where do you think church splits come from? And we've learned, our popular culture has taught us that if we scream loud enough, the other person's not able to deal with us in any sort of logical manner. And, and after a while, they just get tired and go away. And if I had, if, if I had had forethought and been better at stealing pictures from the internet, <laughs> I would have got a picture of that young man standing face to face with that activist who was screaming at him or some poor stone-faced policeman standing face to face. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about. So, so this, is, this is the way things are done in the world, but this is not the way we're supposed to do. So let me read to you just a... Uh, Andy, is it possible to put my clock back up there and leave uh, the screaming Mimi up here? I, I don't know if that's her name, but um, we'll find out if it's possible. Let me read to you, 1 Corinthians 13. You guys know this? It's read in weddings all the time. That's Acts. That's wrong book. If I speak in tongues of men and angels that have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith, so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Listen. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. It is not, uh, it, it just says rude. It says or rude. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. I'd like to ask how many have ever been irritable to make myself feel better. Um, <laughs> but you probably wouldn't tell the truth and I wouldn't feel better at all. So. It does, it's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then he goes on to talk about how everything else is going to disappear with love. Love over me because it's it's um, it, it's bigger, it's more important than uh, than all that other stuff. We uh, well, the reasons I wanted to throw this out here is because this this noise is constantly coming. There are Haman's folks all around us who hate us because we exist. They can't stand that we exist. We are a threat to their worldview. And their worldview is only that thing which goes around them. It's, it's, it's often not very big. And they find others with the same worldview. And uh, again, I'm trying not to get too political, but if you, want to, if you want to do an interesting political study, you can look at the movements and the parties and however you want to describe this, and, and you can probably put them in two camps. And you'll find that one camp, although they, they have diverse goals, um, their bottom line goal is rebellion against God and protection of self. Galatians chapter 5. So when we, when we look at this and we say, well, you know, 
Haman loved himself so much that he was willing to, to, to kill all of these people. And, and then I, I warned us that we need to be careful about not having that attitude against the world, not, not being our screaming Mimi friend up here against the world, and certainly not against one another, not against other believers, just because we disagree about something. Don't feel, we, we, we get threatened and frightened and feel like we've got to strike out or, or shout them down. Galatians uh, 5, you guys probably know this verse. Uh, verse 16, I'm going to read several verses here. But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul wrote that to Christians. And I want you to notice the list. Again, we, we get all wrapped up on things. Notice he puts in this list, he puts immorality and drunkenness and orgies and say, wow, those are bad things. He also puts in there strife, jealousy, anger, and envy. And they're in the same list. It's not like category one, that's where the orgies are. Category two, you know, this is a lesser, this is a lesser felony. Okay, envy is a lesser felony. No, I'm sorry, it's not. They're in, the, they're in the same thing. They're in the same level. James chapter 3. And the fruit of the Spirit, if we, if, if we, let, the, if we let the Holy Spirit work in our lives, um, there are natural things that, those things are produced by the Holy Spirit as we walk with Him. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. That is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we see this conflict between the flesh and the spirit. We see this definition of love. Here we see godly wisdom. And it's different from the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of the flesh, the wisdom of self. The spirit of God and God's wisdom and his kingdom. It's, it, it, it's, a, different, it's a different reaction. Say, so why are you telling us all this? Because of all the pressures that are on us, we'll have ample opportunity to turn into one of these people. And I know Christians who've turned into this this person toward other Christians. Since you don't agree with me, everything you're doing is wrong. Why do they do that? Because they hate them. They do it because they love themselves. They're Christians, yes. And they're protecting their world. And they don't want anyone to shatter it. How big is God? Let me conclude this. And you can get rid of her. I'm tired of looking at her and what everybody else is. Um, I'm sure my 
Simon that shows up will say, it. yeah, but it's his time's up. <laughs> okay. So let me conclude this. Um, chapter 6. Go back to chapter 6. We know the story. I'm not going to go and take you through the whole story. One sentence in chapter 6, verse 1. On that night, the king could not sleep. One of the commentators I read said that this book, you know, it's like a fulcrum, and this book kind of pivot, pivots or hinges on that one, one sentence at the beginning of chapter 6. Because up to this time, everything is going bad. You know, it's all going against Mordecai. It's all going bad against the Jews. Haman is on the ascendancy. But that one little phrase changes everything because what happened? The king can't sleep. He's <laughs> poor king. It's terrible sometimes to be the king. I, I can't sleep. Go bring me the records. I want, I want you to read to me the congressional report. Have you ever read any of the congressional report? I have. Anybody here ever read any of it? Jeez. You're good. You're good if you can't. If, and I, I challenge you. If you can't sleep, there are some speeches there that you can read, and I'm sure they will cure your insomnia. <laughs> and actually, some of the commentators said that's what the king was doing. He said, finally, you know, I, I don't know if he was behind on his work. And he said, well, just knock this off tonight. You know, you read it to me. Or if he was thinking, that'll knock me out. You know, so he couldn't sleep. And, we, and he brought in, and they, they just happened to read the account of how Mordecai saved the king's life. And then the king asked the wonderful king the question, what's been done for this man? And everything changed. Haman shows up at the door just about the time this whole conversation is ending. And in his pride and arrogance, when the king says, who should, how do I honor someone I want to honor? It, Haman thinks he can't be talking of anyone but wonderful me. So it all hinges on one sentence. The king who could not sleep. If I said to you, God will wake even a king to give you a blessing and meet your needs, I'd be missing the point. And I'd be directing your interests away from God who woke the king so his people could be preserved. I would be directing you away from the real point of the omnipotent power of an almighty God who can keep a king awake so that his purpose can be accomplished. I would be directing it away, away directing you away from that and I would be directing it towards your interest. Going through your head would be the things that you need. You know, a car payment or the washing machine or the kids shoes for the kids or something else that's going on. It would be it would all be focused in on you. And don't, not to say that any of those things are, are invalid. Those are real things that we have to deal with. That we have to deal with. But the moment I direct you back to your interests and get you to thinking perhaps that God is there in order to meet your needs and to keep you satisfied, I am a poor pastor. And if you believed me, maybe a little bit strong, but if you believed me, you'd be akin to Haman, thinking that this book was written to make you feel good about yourself. Rather, God wakes the king to further his purpose. And in this particular instance, to preserve his people and so that his own name would be glorified. And folks, that's the story of this book. That God, in his love, saw us in our broken state because of sin and redeems us through his son for his glory. That, that's why the songwriter wrote that grace was amazing. It was amazing. 
when we, when we think about salvation that God provides, our thoughts should be going to Him saying, you know, you're so wonderful. You're wonderful. I'm not. God's wonderful. I'm not. Grace is undeserved. That's what it, that's what it means. Folks, in such a time as this, we need people who love him more than they love themselves. Not people who love him because of what he gives them. Heavenly Father, by your grace, Direct our hearts and our steps away from the destructive tendencies of this broken world that so often have crept into Christian thinking. It affects me, Lord, it, uh, it no doubt affects us all. We have to regularly commit ourselves to you and let you renew our minds. So that we'll think like your spirit would direct us. Forgive us, Lord, if we've gotten caught up in the screamy face stuff. If we've called people's names, especially in this politically charged environment we're in. God, especially have mercy on us if we call other believers' names. And mock them and ridicule them because what they did threaten. Fill us with your love. Wonderful, cleansing, perfect love. The confidence that we have in you. No one can take us from your hand. And you're with us all times. Allows us to surrender to you. And let you protect us. Would you stand with me and we'll sing again and, and give you an opportunity to just kind of focus on the Lord for a few minutes. All right, let's stand and let's turn to number um, 281. And I'm going to get out of the way now, guys. Come. Two
you have a you have a time. And you you may not be Esther, but you have a time. And it's this. this one. May I have one next week? Use it for 